trying to achieve rental relief from your landlords. I think uh, it, it's come to the time where we need to be talking about closing the deal. We really need at this point to be uh, in final discussions and negotiations with our landlords on agreements around rent relief. Um, for most businesses, the worst of the impact uh, appears to be over and sales we're seeing from all of our clients are returning much closer to 2019 figures. So they may still be impacted, but certainly not to the level of April where uh, obviously uh, some <clears throat> retail data came out in the past week or so, uh, the worst retail sales month in history, uh, undoubtedly and undisputed. Uh, but retail across most sectors, most most uh, businesses are returning to normal unless you're unfortunately still one of the ones uh, deeply impacted by the government uh, initiatives. Um, gyms are still uh, probably significantly affected <clears throat> some uh, restaurants and so on but for the large part uh, retailers uh, are returning more to normal the impact of that is is that uh, you want to be negotiating based on the impact of the worst month and uh, achieve the best result you can for the period um, legislation is in in place now in every state so there's no further roadblocks or hold-ups that will and we'll talk about that a little bit um, so now is the best time to close off negotiations, finalise agreements, put something in place. Um, so flick through to the next one, Jess. No. As soon as it wants to. Yeah. <laughs> we can wait. We can wait. So um, essentially the roadblocks have been removed. Okay. Queensland and WA now have regulations passed into legislation. Uh, many landlords, and we've talked about it the last few weeks, have been holding off, uh, entering into agreements, waiting for the legislation in the large part, hoping that uh, uh, there was something there a little in the landlord's favour, um, like Victoria, where, <clears throat> where the regulation uh, didn't clarify proportional rent relief. So landlords have taken advantage of that to a degree and not offered proportional relief on the back of that legislation. Uh, luckily, in Queensland and WA, uh, in both cases, it's largely tenant biased uh, in line with the code uh, and, and possibly even improve it, uh, particularly with WA, uh, where it um, certainly opens the opportunity to uh, negotiate better than 50% um, minimum waived rent uh, and where a landlord uh, indicates that they um, uh, aren't providing rent relief in accordance with the code, they have to essentially prove that they can't afford that. Um, so the regulations are now in place. It, um, there's some clarity on sufficient information and particularly in those two states where landlords have been asking for uh, significant information that we've talked about in the past, the BAS statements, P&Ls and things like that. Um, it's very clear now and, and uh, we'll look at exactly what you do need to provide and uh, will be considered sufficient. Um, and uh, both of these states, Queensland, and WA, the last two, uh, along with Victoria, have timeframes around the process for uh, once the once the process is initiated uh, for landlords to provide a, a response and a, an agreement to be put in place. Um, with WA, you're, the landlord is required to provide an offer within 14 days of the tenant uh, request, formally requesting rent relief. Um, in Queensland, it's 30 days for an agreement to be reached once the process is initiated by either party. Uh, so there's some really good stuff in the in the legislation. It's very clear and it's easy to follow. Um, again, as I said last week, you, you can um, access uh, copies of the legislation for your state on our website. Um, click through to the resource page and onto the COVID regulations or COVID legislation and then find uh, the, the detail you require there. Uh, pop through the next one, <clears throat> Jess, while I have a look. 
So it's time to finalise agreements now. A great little picture there of two people uh, agreeing on something and something growing out of that. Um, <clears throat> uh, relief, in, in the case of this pandemic, it's um, generally based on the worst performing month, which is certainly the April data. Um, so the longer it takes to finalise the agreement from now, the weaker your argument is to get the level of relief proportionate to April impact. Um, landlord can argue uh, as sales improve that uh, you shouldn't have proportional relief to the April data but to what's being achieved now and so on. So um, I would suggest that you are placing your formal request based on April and, and May data and not waiting for June data. Um, the request that you, you place in every state um, really to get the deal done, to, to finalise it, to get it signed off, needs to be formal and in writing um, and it has to reference the specific requirements in your state's legislation. Uh, we, we just want to remove all roadblocks, um, any barriers to the deal being finalised. <clears throat> so there's at least three key pieces of information uh, that we need to provide, and we'll have a look at that on the next slide, Jess. Certainly. So I've actually put up pictures here, actual pictures from a actual client, uh, and these are uh, two of the three pieces of information that we've had to provide in order to secure uh, a finalised agreement. And this was actually a landlord who previously was requesting uh, numerous other items of uh, information <clears throat> and uh, we've reduced that back. So the key elements of your formal request are to provide a letter or an email which includes advice confirming your eligibility for relief um, and that eligibility is uh, that your JobKeeper enrolled. So the document there on the right is a uh, printout from the ATO uh, portal, JobKeeper portal, uh, has the company's details and um, proof that they are enrolled and eligible and actually being paid the JobKeeper. There's several different forms of that that can be used. Um, you either access that direct from your portal if, you, if, if you're managing your JobKeeper, otherwise just ask for it from your accountant if they're dealing with it for you. Um, <clears throat> You need to be obviously under 50 mil in turnover and this is where there is an argument for them uh, seeking a BAS statement or a, or a, a tax statement from the last financial year. Uh, it, we've certainly had success with just having an accountant write a letter uh, confirming that turnover for the business was less than 50 mil and being signed by uh, a licensed accountant. Um, and, of course, proof that the impact on the business was greater than 30%. Um, so the, the spreadsheet on the, on the left is uh, an updated version of, of an example I've shown you before. This is an actual one with um, data from a client showing uh, each month comparable with the, the key months highlighted. Uh, some information on the right-hand side advising what happened in that month. Uh, this is a business that's impacted greatly by uh, the lack of tourism where it's located. Uh, so when flights stopped, business stopped. Um, that's highlighted there. The, the actual percent impact is is highlighted and it's clear. And, and the key part here is at the bottom, it's signed by the company's accountant, um, so uh, that satisfies all requirements for proof of impact on turnover. Um, you need to state in that letter exactly what you're seeking. Um, be very clear, bullet point, I'm seeking 62% uh, reduction in rent during the COVID period or for April, May and June. Um, be very clear on exactly what you're seeking and that the documentation you're providing supports that. Um, and then also what you're seeking for the reasonable recovery period, uh, which may be negotiated later on but needs to be on the table now. And the supporting documents, uh, as, as we've shown there, highlighted there. Um, that is uh, 
the key elements of your formal rent relief request to the landlord. Um, so if you pop through the next slide, Jess will... Um, um, obviously, this type of negotiation is quite different to negotiating a new lease for a client or uh, negotiating a lease renewal or some other critical event um, where um, essentially we're, we're assessing the least worst option. Um, there's nothing hugely positive for any party uh, in this. Um, so I'll just put down three little points here to kind of put it in perspective. There's plenty of negotiators out there that believe that they've done their job well if their client's happy and the other side is unhappy. Um, at LPC Chris, our usual measure of successful outcome in negotiating lease deals or critical events associated with lease deals is we, we like both parties to be excited about signing the deal and, and, and if they are, then we've certainly done our job. Um, I think with negotiations around uh, um, COVID-19 and the, the pandemic issue and rent relief associated with that and the fact that it's legislative requirement that landlords provide that, um, no one's really winning. So really what we're looking for here is that if both parties are equally dissatisfied with the deal, then the outcome is probably a good one. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. I don't think anyone's going to be overly happy with the deal, uh, but if both parties are equally dissatisfied, um, then they're certainly sharing the load, um, as is the intent of the, of the uh, mandatory code of conduct. Uh, and hopefully, as a result, everyone comes out the other side. Continuity of business is critical for both parties. Um, nobody's going to be overly excited with the outcomes, but uh, that's the objective. So with that, we'll move on to the next next sheet and I really just want to open it up for Q&A because uh, that seems to be where we're getting the um, <coughs> really good quality uh, questions and hopefully some good answers for you. Uh, so we'll open up the Q&A and please, as per last week, if you want to connect with us, uh, jump on LinkedIn. You connect, can connect with me personally by searching my name. Um, our, our company LinkedIn page has regular updates from all of our advisors across commercial, retail and even industrial uh, and project services. So all aspects of your retail business uh, or your business in general, um, very, very uh, good and consistent information there and from our website, of course, uh, where you can click on a button like that one on the left-hand bottom corner and you can uh, register and have... Uh, updates sent out to you by email regularly around COVID and, and retail and leasing, commercial leasing specific information. So hopefully everyone's had time to uh, join in a couple of questions. What have we yes, got? we have a couple of good ones. And as Kyle said, please feel free to ask your questions, everybody, if you're thinking it. Chances are two or three other people are thinking of the same question as well. So don't be shy, bring them forward. So the first one is from John and he asks, we are expecting a delayed impact of COVID on our sales and profit from July onwards. Recognising that eligibility focused on immediate negative impact by COVID on sales, do you have any advice about approaching landlords for a backdated rent relief if the impact on one's business was not immediate but is a direct result of COVID? Yeah, it really doesn't matter that it wasn't immediate um, and it doesn't matter that the uh, seeking the relief is delayed at all. It's the pandemic period is from March 29 to uh, September 27 or thereabouts, uh, <clears throat> uh, slightly different if you're in New South Wales, April uh, 23rd to October 22nd or so. Um, but the pandemic period is is indicated to be that six-month period. Uh, 
uh, and we need to assess the impact on the business over the whole six months. So, yes, while well, I've said today that most people have been impacted the most in April, if, you're, if the impact on your business is a, a more delayed response, that's fine as well. I, I would still use the same type of spreadsheet to show the, the monthly impact and really the, the, the uh, principles and the intent of the code were to agree on a level of impact uh, across the entire uh, COVID period. So that pandemic period in the first instance and then the reasonable recovery period after that. So I don't think it matters at all that uh, your significant impact happens in June or July or August. Um, uh, if you've already lodged something with the landlord, hopefully that had a caveat on it that if anything significant changes, then, then uh, there's the opportunity to readdress it. Um, many of the agreements so far have been focused on the first three months with uh, the option to um, uh, check and see how things are going by July uh, and and most also involve uh, monthly updates and adjusting re rent relief on a monthly basis going forward. So I don't think there's any problem at all, John, with uh, achieving rent relief uh spread across the six months in, in proportion to the overall impact. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I hope that answers your question, John. On to the next question from Kelly. Yep. I'm in Victoria. When should we follow up on our application for rent relief? We sent our application on the 1st of June, 2020. 1st of June. Oh, look, um, uh, I think I mentioned last week, we, we would... At LPC Crestwood, if we issue something, we would normally follow up within five to seven days. Um, you know, 48, 72 hours, fine. Uh, often it goes to a property manager who has to uh, forward that on to a, a lessor or a landowner, the landlord uh, themselves, and get a response back to communicate to. So you know, often there's a, a lag. Uh, we would generally allow one week for that. Uh, but if uh, approaching the end of two weeks there's no response, uh, a gentle, subtle follow-up would certainly be uh, uh, normal and expected. Um, but if there's any, any further delaying beyond that, it would be a more urgent follow-up. So uh, given it was 1st of June, um, now... Victoria is uh, not one that has a time frame in the regulations from memory. Um, you might double check that by searching through that regulation yourself, but uh, pretty sure there's no uh, regulation uh, on the, the time frame for agreement like there is in New South Wales. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, just double check that. I, I, I will also. Um, the Queensland and WA certainly have, have uh, shorter time frames. Okay. okay. Follow up now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, hopefully this helps you, Kelly, in following up with your application. Next one from Alice. Have you noticed that some landlords are less helpful, Centre Group versus Stocklands, for example? I ask because some landlords are wanting to add a clause that no, for the, that no further funds pardon me, can be sought if there is a second wave. We have knocked this back. Is this something you have seen? Yeah, I haven't seen that one specifically, and uh, yeah, I would certainly knock it back. Um, you know, it's uh, it's that's up for legislation at the time. I think. Um, look, uh, landlords obviously want to try to protect themselves, and um, and that's an interesting way of doing it. Um, I would, uh, I would certainly be going to them in relation to the to the uh, uh, legislation that's in front of us now for this pandemic period. It doesn't have anything to do with a, a second wave. Um, the pandemic period is is defined by the government. Um, currently, it's a six month period, and they may shorten that or increase it. Uh, if there's a second wave and the government decides to increase that pandemic period as it's defined, then um, then you know it's 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 determined by the government. Um, if there's some second wave or a different event later on, then there would need to be some government intervention around that as well. But um, 
I would certainly not be signing on an agreement to that and, and I think that's bound to end up in front of the Small Business Commissioner's Office being mediated on and um, it's actually the first time I've, I've heard of that one so um, I think I'll make a note of that one. Mm, yes, that's certainly the first I've heard of it as well. Well, yeah. uh, thank you, Alice, for your question and hopefully... Uh, just, yeah, just to give Alice a, a bit of a heads up, I, I pretty much have a conversation with Dominic Lamb at the NRA on a weekly basis to identify things like that. So that will certainly um, get passed on to Dominic, who has regular conversations with uh, relevant people involved in this, like the National Cabinet, the, the State Treasurers. Um, last week it was the ACCC, um, and that would certainly be one for her to be aware of um, for, for further follow-up. Yes, most definitely. Okay, another question from Rob. Hi, I have stores and shopping centres in Victoria and due to their size, the base rent makes up about half of my total rent. Outgoings make up the other half. The centres are saying they will not give us any relief on outgoings as this is what the code states. Is this something we are able to fight? It's looking like we will only be chasing relief it, uh, in the April period due to a recover in sales recovery in sales? Um, yeah, look, it's, it's a difficult one because if a landlord's determined to adhere to the code and strictly to the code, then, you know, they're really not legally obligated to do otherwise. Um, you know, the, the, the code and, and the regulations in most states uh, do leave scope for um, negotiating terms outside of the code uh, and that uh, at the end of the day, the, the overarching principles and the intent of the code is to ensure that um, business continuity that I mentioned before, that the business is able to continue to trade and to meet its lease obligations post-COVID-19. Um, clearly, if, uh, if you're in a shopping centre with a, a large store and paying uh, 200 plus dollars a square metre uh, in outgoings, then, then that's significantly impacts on your ability, ability to continue to trade uh, or, or meet your lease obligations during COVID-19 and certainly uh, afterwards as well. So, look, while there's, there is most certainly compelling grounds for having conversations about the outgoings and there's some relief in, in certain states' legislations around uh, landlords needing to provide relief um, on other, other costs, um, I would need to look very closely at the Victorian legislation to uh, clarify what angle we could take in that in that situation uh, to provide a compelling argument to the landlord. Um, so that that's one Rob that I would need to look really specifically at and uh, trawl through the the Victorian legislation to find an angle that we could. Um, we could argue with the landlord on, but the key one being uh, it, essentially it means that you're only getting relief on about a quarter of uh, of your uh, cost burden, and that may result in uh, the business not being able to continue uh, post-COVID, and that's clearly not uh, the objective of, of the code. Um and it's not of any benefit to the landlord either. No, that's certainly not. Okay, Rob, hopefully that answers your question. And it seems like we have our final question from Mark. And he asks, do you think landlords will be motivated to finalise rent relief deals as we get closer to the 30th of June, particularly those who are Australia Stock Exchange listed? Uh, well... You know, some landlords like Westfields have a, a financial year based on the calendar, so that's different. Um, uh, um, it could be it could be a play in the negotiations to try to wrap it up by then, and to uh, to have them be able to uh, write down that that uh, loss uh, in in this past financial year. I think. Um, probably a good strategy to use in the states where there's not a time frame around it. If you if you start now in WA, it should be finalised before the end of the month anyway. 
um, in other states, if it, if it is dragging on in South Australia, for example, um, if it is dragging on, then uh, it would certainly come into play if if, uh, if you felt that was a, a, a financial consideration for a landlord. They're going to be impacted in the next financial year as well, so it would probably be good to spread that uh, loss over consecutive financial years rather than push it all into next, next financial year. Um, if you can get some benefit from that in uh, getting a landlord to agree to something sooner uh, or at least getting them thinking about that, then I would certainly uh, be employing that strategy. Okay, wonderful advice there. And if there are no other questions, we will wrap up here. Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. And I hope that Kyle has uh, given some insight into any situations that apply to you at the moment. As always, if you have any more questions, today is not the end of it. You can forward them to marketing at nra.net.au and we will forward them on to Kyle who will do his best to help you with, you, help you with your situation. Kyle, do you have any final remarks for our attendees today? Um, no, look, it's... It's been a bit of a slog for 10 or 11 weeks for everyone. I understand that. Um, we are still working on uh, gaining agreements for a number of clients and there's some really good landlords and there's some horror landlords. Um, uh, I'm thinking unless something comes up during the week and anyone puts forward uh, an FAQ that they'd like covered, I uh, might uh, focus on some, some uh, case studies perhaps next week. Um, give people uh, some idea of how things have progressed and what results have been achieved, um, what challenges, uh, how, how certain challenges have been overcome. Um, maybe that might provide some stimulus to get uh, things across the line or some encouragement to keep trying anyway. Certainly. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Kyle, for your time. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Good afternoon, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Jess. Cheers. Bye.